feedback both ways, how to improve the materials quality by looking at the RPS data. And then uh, we, far, we looked at this bismuth selenide, this two, three series, and there are four compounds in that series. Only bismuth selenide is clean. Antimony telluride is terrible because it has five surface states. It's even, it's dealing with this is even worse than bismuth and uh, antimony alloy. Can you, can you deduce whether it is the topologically non-trivial or trivial class? Uh, it again, it has the surface reconstructions. It's, one has to do STM and RPS together to rule out what is trivial surface state, what is surface reconstruction, and what is topological. It's, it's a very lengthy. Yeah, well, I mean, five, so far it looks like it is topological. It's okay. five. But yeah, it's. But your, your, your calculation should, should be one, right? On the surface state and bismuth antimony telluride are five. Uh, for bismuth selenide, is, uh, antimony selenide is trivial, antimony telluride is not trivial. Yeah, yeah, we are finding five. <laughs> so that's not trivial. But I'm saying that it's, it, it has odd number states, but it's, it's also surface reconstruction. That's something we don't want. So this is not good. So do you know the details of the surface discovery? I'll, I'll show some data. Uh, I thought I had that already. Okay, anyway. So, <clears throat> however, antimony, although it's a metal, it has non-trivial Z2 number. So we looked at antimony in extensive detail in connection to bismuth antimony. The advantage in antimony is it's pure material. There's no alloying disorder, nothing. It's very clean, and it confirms that what we said about bismuth antimony is correct. <coughs> How about bismuth? Bismuth is a more complicated, I'm coming here, next bismuth. So far, there is some, okay, let me, I'll mention that later. So if, uh, if we start putting antimony into bismuth, it turns out only 9% uh, uh, bismuth gives you an insulating state, and the gap is a Dirac gap because the bands are very much Dirac-like, conical. Uh, and of course, because of the mass, this part is rounded. It's not in my schematic, but in reality, it's more rounded. So uh, now, it's, it's, well, it's known that there is no inversion from antimony to bismuth, but there is, Liu and Alain would say there is inversion between bismuth and bismuth antimony, right? Is that correct? Well, it's not just yeah. Liu and Alain. I mean, there's also, there's also experiments, I think, which look at how the bands move, and I think they're getting, they, they get closer together first, and then they get further apart. So there's, I see, that I see. So, but those are cycles from resonance. Right. right. Yeah. I think right. So it's, uh, you can see that I haven't labeled <laughs> whether there is an inversion transition or not because the experimental data, at least my data, does not enlighten us on this, whether there is transition or not. But at, at least we know this side is non trivial. So that's why we are focusing on that. This, it's difficult to sort out that side. So bismuth could be tri uh, tri uh, trivial or non trivial. It's not experimentally settled. Okay, so now if we cleave the surface of bismuth antimony, oh, I should also point out uh, that this insulating state is realized only by 9%. So your main matrix is still long range ordered bismuth. And this, although these are alloys, your back peaks are low, less than 0 0.01. Uh, angle, I mean degrees. So they are long range order, high quality crystals. So what is the alloying disorder? Nine out of 100 bismuth atom, it's a positional disorder. And it turns out it's extremely insignificant. And, yeah, in, 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 no, no. And it does not destroy the translational invariance. One can see that this is, this is a picture that it does not surface. Uh, it's translationally invariant. K is a good quantum number in this alloy. That's because it's only 9% antimony, and it's not a, it's a site disorder. It's not positional. Okay. So uh, bismuth has two pockets, one electron pocket at the L point and hole pocket at the T point. 
So when I go from this map to empty money, then uh, these pockets, they open up a gap. So I should get, see a gap uh, it, uh, at all these points. So if I consider the projection of this 3D Brian zone along the 111 axis, this is the projected surface Brian zone, gamma bar, k bar, m bar, at the high symmetry points, and only m bar is uh, a time reversal invariant point, k bar is not, and gamma by, def I mean, by default it's time reversal invariant. So uh, if we look at the emission photoelectron intensity at the Fermi level, we see a uh, uh, nice k space periodicity, and we see this star map, uh, and then this tricks of light. And uh, so, and this is so strong. This is this is such a robust surface, state, such a robust state that you can see that in within an hour, and that never happens with photoemission if you try to look at bulk states. And uh, you can be lousy about preparing surface and still get this state data. It's very reproducible. So. If I look at this bulk band structure, I project it on, onto the surface, I would expect one pocket at M, because L projects to M, and another pocket at gamma. Okay? I, well, I mean, say somehow this sample is metallic or bad or whatever, it should go around, you only, only perturb around your mean field solution, that's, that's what I'm saying. But that's not what is happening, there's no pocket, this is star pattern. So that's very strange. So we want to isolate surface and bulk in a systematic way and in a, in a thorough way. So what we do, we walk around, we track all the trajectories in the three-dimensional case space. And you can, you can sit down with your photoelectric equation conservation loss and you can convince yourself that we can do that. This is standard. Actually, this is how people figured out the gallium arsenide band structure in the 80s. It's not new. It's a well-known technique. OK, so if I, if, I, uh, if I take a cut through the L point, this yellow is my cut. So this is my cut through the L point. And I look, I somehow I lost the axis. It should be, uh, mil, uh, this is, uh, there should be a point here. This is electron volt. <coughs> okay. So, uh, and this is the momentum axis. Uh, so, if I cut through L point, this is the L point, and then this is my scan, and I look at the deeper binding energy along this cut. So, in the deeper binding energy states, I see this these two bands, pair of bands, and then I see a bunch of stuff piled up there. So this is a basic LDA calculation. Actually, uh, it works better if you have spin orbit, then tight binding is simpler. Uh, it's actually tight binding with uh, spin orbit. One can do this band calculation. It's consistent with Liu and Allen. Uh, uh, so these are the bulk states, the solid bands. And these circle bands, they don't have correspondence with the data. I mean, uh, the circle band is the one that cannot be traced from the experiment. So there is correspondence between bulk and our measurement, bulk calculation, except for this top band. Or maybe there is other stuff down there. Now, if I take a cut along this line, one can see it's a three-dimensional. There will be enormous KZ dispersion. Of this uh, of this compound, so one would see a radical change of the band structure from in going from here to here, the deeper lying states. So now the deeper lying states are completely different. This pair of states are there, and then one can see that we have correspondence in the experiment of the deeper lying states. Only the top state, there is no correspondence in the band calculation. So my first suspect would be that these states, they don't, uh, they don't have any correspondence with the bulk. They are funny. So they might be surface states. Question? Yeah. <coughs> what is denoted by the blue? Because it seems like the blue is the one that was missing from the calculation on top, but then on the bottom it's one of your, or uh, maybe I'm wrong about blue. Is it purple? What? Oh, these are the bulk bands, the solid. And on, on top, 
uh, that's also it's also bulk band. So in this case, the surface and bulk are degenerate. <coughs> okay. But ex as an experimentalist, I want to find out my way of separating it without resorting to anybody's calculation. So this is how we, I do it. How to isolate bulk and surface states without uh, using any band calculation? So what I do here is that, uh, so if, if, my, if I have electron waves uh, in a three-dimensional box, they have a kz dependence, k square plus k y square plus kz square. For a two-dimensional electrons, there's no kz dependence. So if I change k sub z, the states would be unaffected. My signal would be unaffected. Okay? So I'm changing the perpendicular momentum by changing the photon energy that one can relate through the photoelectric uh, scattering process. And uh, without having to model the step, because I'm only interested in the relative dispersion, not the absolute position of that KZ band, uh, uh, cut. Okay, so then what I see is that the states near the Fermi level, they, they do not change with photon energy, but the states below the Fermi level, for example, this peak, it has crazy dispersion. Right, it's, it's dispersing with, the, uh, as I change photon energy, the state moves. So that means this state has three-dimensional dispersion. It cares about the fact that I'm changing k sub z, and this state is two-dimensional dispersion, and it, it doesn't care about uh, k sub z, that the experimental k sub z has changed. So the state near the Fermi level is something that we, are, we suspected that it's surface state because it has no correspondence with the bulk. Okay, so now I remove the surface states. That's what we do in, uh, when we study superconductors of our correlated systems. And I, I, because I'm interested in the bulk band structure. Well, bulk band structure can be slightly modified in the surface, but there's correspondence overall correspondence. If I do that, and then I, I do that all over the three-dimensional Brion zone, after doing a lot of, taking a lot of data, I can model this band. And what we find is that the L band, it has this Dirac-like dispersion with a gap. The gap is about uh, 50 millivolt. And that this nicely agrees with the bulk calculation by, it was, I think, by Fukuyama and Kubo back in the 60s that uh, L band in uh, bismuth, bismuth antimony, it's only 10% antimony, so it should not change that much. So now I only retain what is available at the right at the Fermi energy, Fermi level, chemical potential. If I do that, then I get uh, this beautiful pattern, uh, Fermi surface, and uh, and this, since it's right at the Fermi level and it has dispersion, uh, through the Fermi level, so uh, so it's gapless. I'll, I'll show more evidence that it's gapless. So what is it? Uh, and so now the challenge is: uh, is this surface Fermi surface trivial or non-trivial? So what was the evidence that the bulk bands do not intersect with the energy? Uh, here, let me. So this is this is how close it gets. It, it, well, I mean, one can. I'll show more data along that line. So there is a, this is the Fermi energy is zero. It's below. It's a gap. It's also known from optics. One can do optical conductivity and see it's a gap. It was done by uh, by Russians in the 80s, uh, in the 670s or 80s. Okay. But that does not mean that there is no impurity or other things. You have, you can have other things spinning the 